Good morning, everyone. I wanted to thank everybody for coming out today in uh, this uh, rainy weather. I really appreciate everybody coming out for the second annual uh, Community Health Symposium uh, at the Community Community Clinic. For those who are new to the clinic, just a really quick background in terms of how this came about and why we're doing this. Um, the clinic's been around for about 36 years, uh, serving this community, but we wanted to ask ourselves what can we do more uh, to help out the community. And when we looked at the needs, um, we wanted to help not only our patients, uh, but those who hold part of the support of the clinic. Um, and that's how this proposal came about. At the very least, we wanted to be a resource of very good evidence-based medicine uh, for our community. Uh, last year's uh, topic focused on navigating mortality or end of life issues. For those of you who missed it or may be interested in the topic, the entire symposium is actually on video online as well. Uh, this year, I think we're focusing on something that may be a little bit more difficult. But if you think about it, if you summed up in three words, which are the teenage year, right? Uh, where kids are hormonally starting to grow, they're you know, gaining their independence. And at that point in their life, they seem to think that they know it all already. Right? Um, as a father of uh, two young children, uh, both six and three, I can only tell you how uh, difficult uh, it is to be to help them navigate that period in their life when they're going to have to deal with not only uh, various pressures, whether it's from their peers, uh, social media, um, or just the, the pace that life seems to be uh, moving more and more at a faster uh, pace. So, uh, at the very end, you know, we, we want them to be happy and healthy. Hopefully, I think with the encounter that we've assembled today, you guys will be able to walk away with some information or various tools to get back with you for your friends and family. Uh, with that, I have the honor of introducing our panel today. First is Dr. Uh, Tangerman, who is a child and adolescent psychologist who received his doctorate from the uh, Pepperdine University and completed his postdoctoral um, internship at the Morrison Child and Family Services in Portland, Oregon, where he worked with uh, juveniles in the correctional system. Uh, he also completed his postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard UCLA, where he specialized in the treatment and assessment of children and adolescents in various uh, disorders. He currently serves as the clinical director of mental health services for STAR of California, uh, where he's spearheading evidence-based treatment and implementation for students uh, in the school districts both in Los Angeles and Orange County. Um, he's had multiple publications in the area of adolescent disruptive behavior, trauma, and suicide. He continues to maintain his uh, faculty positions both at Harvard UCLA Medical Center and at Pepperdine University, where he's currently conducting uh, research on uh, behavioral therapy for adolescent therapy for uh, individuals who have self injury or uh, attempted suicide. Uh, on top of that, he's uh, married and just had a child. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also have the honor of introducing to you guys um, a pediatric nurse practitioner who has been with the clinic for more than 20 years, uh, Melanie uh, Balestra, a graduate from the uh, Duke University in UCLA. She's also been the past president of the California Association for Nurse Practitioners and the American College of Nurse Practitioners. She is the Orange County Legislative Board Representative the National Association of Nurse Practitioners. So that novel, I'll let you know that she's actually also a lawyer. <laughs> um, when she's not serving the community and uh, her colleagues, she actually volunteers her time also in Mexico, Africa, and Cambodia. And I can say this today with Dr. Ben in the room, but before Dr. Ben there was Dr. Romaro San Marco May, who was uh, my mentor. Um, and besides my parent, he's probably the single reason why I'm standing before you today as a physician. Uh, he is uh, board certified both in family medicine and addiction medicine. He is undergraduate at UC Davis, obtained uh, a medical degree from UCI, as well as his MBA from UCI. He has uh, leadership and health delivery experience in multiple levels of care related to substance abuse disorders, both in an inpatient and an outpatient manner. Uh, he served as the family director for the Memorial Care Addiction Medicine Unit and has held uh, directorship for several residential and outpatient treatments operations as well. Um, if you know him, you know that he's a very active and passionate individual whose current passions are for advocating for improving access to care for people with substance use disorders. He is currently the medical director for substance use disorders at Molina Healthcare. Uh, and again, besides uh, his medical education, he's got three kids he's uh, taking care of at home. 
Uh, we are very fortunate today to have uh, Dr. Garrett Spears, who graduated from UCLA and went on to attain his medical degree at the Medical College of Wisconsin, uh, thereby then after finishing a residency in psychiatry at UCI, and has been a fiber in this community for the last 35 years, practicing at Dana Point and being associated with Mission Hospital. And last, uh, definitely not least, probably the individual who's probably touched more lives in this community in terms of the patient population that we're discussing today. We have um, this is uh, Dean Perry, who for the last 35 years has been a teacher uh, in this community, and then in 2014 went on to become a member of the Laguna Beach Board of Education. Um, so someone who on a daily basis is advocating and having to deal with the uh, mental issues that our, our team population have to deal with. So uh, lots of uh, good information hopefully will be shared today. I will pass this on to Dr. Uh, Tangerine, who has a wealth to share with you as well. Can you help me uh, um, welcome Dr. Tenshin? Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> so excited to be here at the second annual Community Health Symposium. Uh, if you want to can hear me, speak louder. Dr. Ball, thank you for that. Um, so, I was asked to speak on teen mental health, and that was it. And so that's a very broad swap. Um, so I went overboard. I wasn't even going to do PowerPoints. Um, and then I started digging into some data, and the data and error, and so I have a whole bunch of charts and graphs that I want to show. So I'm going to try to see through it. Um, so probably a little bit. Uh, before we start, I want to get a sense of uh, who is in the room, who the audience is. So, um, if you're a mental health professional, raise your hand. Yes, one. One great soul. Um, education. Parents. Parents of adolescents. Anybody who was an adolescent? <laughs> Um, parents and adolescents, who, you put your hand up if your child, this is totally informal, I'm just curious, if your child is at a driving age, and will you leave them up if they have their driver's license? Interesting. So I'll, I'll touch on that in a little bit, but just, just curious. Okay, so um, what I wanted to do today, I'm going to touch on uh, four areas. Uh, the first is describing or defining adolescence, and we'll talk a little bit about what's going on in our teens' brains during adolescence. Uh, it's a scary thing, but it's also a very exciting thing. Uh, so that's going to be the message uh, today, is both opportunity and vulnerability. Um, we're going to hit on the importance of social relationships and social interaction. Uh, I'm also going to talk about our current stats, what our, our current teens are up to. Not to, uh, as well as some um, current evidence based treatments for, uh, for some of these issues. So, we'll start with what is adolescence? Um, I think way back when, one of the uh, very early 1900s, uh, Stanley Hall said adolescence is a period of storm and stress. And while not the most uh, definitive or elaborative, he, he hit on something. Um, it is a stormy and stressful time, but it's also a time of uh, really astounding opportunity for brain development and growth. Uh, historically, adolescence was marked by the rite of passage. And so uh, as children grew to be adults, boys would often have to go out and do some crazy, dangerous activity, become a man, uh, girls became women when they, when they became of a, a childbearing age. But uh, today is a little bit different. We are transitioning from childhood dependency to adult responsibility. And dependency and responsibility um, are loose terms. So certainly uh, a child, a young child, um, as Dr. Revolve can attest, and certainly I think as well, is uh, certainly dependent on parents for a whole host of things, food, shelter, uh, love support, et cetera. When we get to adolescence, um, adolescents are burgeoning, uh, autonomous, independence. Um, 
the problem that we're seeing now is that there aren't a lot of entry level jobs uh, for adolescents. The cost of education, and uh, mm -hmm. certainly you want to go on beyond your bachelor's, uh, you are going to accrue a lot of student debt. A lot of it. Uh, I can attest to that. So definitely still paying off my student debt. Uh, so you have these. Uh, these barriers for adolescents to really become independent and responsible adults. Uh, so that means more teens are depending on mom and dad, depending on parents, maybe living at home, depending on money. So we have this, this uh, odd extended adolescence. Um, and really that fits well with adolescent brain development. You know, the, you guys heard the statistic, the frontal lobes of the brain aren't fully developed and no one so old, et cetera, et cetera. Women are ahead of men, of course, usually in almost in all areas. Uh, but usually, all women are not in this. Uh, but usually it's uh, 24, 25, mid 20s, when you really start to consolidate a lot of that uh, prefrontal cortex and the big frontal lobes, all the good stuff that's associated with decision making. So 12 to 24 is really what I'm going to be talking about for adolescents. So if you're, nobody's here that's uh, under 24, but if you're under 24, if you're 24, you're an adolescent. So when we talk about brain development, I'm just gonna give you, this is one slide on, on brain development. So we're gonna, we're gonna parse it down uh, real brief. Um, essentially, in childhood, you know that the brain is developing, and it's developing in a big way. Um, my daughter is almost four months old, I can see just crazy brain developments almost every day. And that brain development uh, continues into adolescence. The term synaptogenesis is the, uh, essentially means that the synaptic connections between your brain cells, your neurons, anybody take Psych 101? Yeah, you guys remember the neurons and the axons and the dendrites and the little synapse and the neurotransmitters are going around crazy in there. So all those connections, are growing, that's synapogenesis is. And it's exploding in early childhood and it explodes again in early adolescence. Mid to late adolescence, you see the biggest um, events of pruning. And pruning is essentially all those connections are kind of being pruned away and the connections that are being used are strengthened. Right? So they're kind of getting rid of all the excess connections. So you've got this big brain explosion, all this cool stuff, our teens are going crazy, they're exploring, they're absorbing information, and then it starts to kind of remodel the brain, kind of pare it down a little bit. Myelination is just uh, essentially creating, the, making those connections go even faster. So the more you use it, the stronger it becomes. Remember, when you're like, one one class, I think the quote I learned was that the neurons that fire together, wire together. <laughs> Yeah, it's stuck with me, so it's, it's, uh, it's very true. Uh, so the printing is important, but it also represents uh, an opportunity vulnerability. This is where we often <laughs> see a lot of uh, mental health concerns onset. It's when uh, adolescents are at risk if uh, printing is especially intense, or if uh, printing is off in some way, then you can see the emergence potentially of some of these mental health concerns. What could create printing to be off or intense? Well, high stress situations, trauma, neglect, all that good stuff. Um, I'm gonna make an argument uh, for a decrease in social interaction today for our teens and the risk that that's causing in your own brain development. So experience and environment is key, um, especially during these teenage years. Um, as a practice, I used to tell my, my clients, if you're gonna, if you're gonna smoke pot, just wait as long as possible, wait for all that printing to kind of take hold, and then smoke them. But at this point, very important for brain development, try to keep toxins down, experience up. Dan Siegel, anybody familiar with Dan Siegel's work? He's got a ton of great books out there. Um, I'm just gifting his books to uh, new parents. Um, he's got uh, one of his more recent books is an adolescent uh, brain development book. It's written for adolescents. Uh, he develops his mindset tools. But he posits that there's four key elements for adolescent brain development. Okay? And this should look familiar to parents and all of 
us who are adolescents. The first thing that the adolescent brain is wired to do is to seek pleasure and to drive for these high reward activities, novelty seeking. This is like seeking out of the house, speeding around cars, out of school, doing all sorts of new exciting stuff. The second is this proclivity towards social engagement. Okay, so social interaction is key, it's a drive for connectedness. Now those two first two things are important for evolution. Right? This is what helps kids grow up, get out of the house, go out, meet new people, start their own family, procreate, etc. The third element is, uh, no surprise to anyone, uh, increased emotional intensity. So we have a lot stronger emotions going on here. The, the limbic and the brainstem, which is kind of the more primitive stuff down below, are actually way more active in adolescence than any other time, which means that the emotions arise rapidly, intensely, and it takes a long time to calm down because they don't have that calming influence of our prefrontal cortex just yet. Uh, the last one is uh, thinking outside of the box, creative exploration. Adolescents now have the ability for abstract thought. So now they get to come up with all sorts of uh, creative ways to get in trouble. Did you guys ever do the, uh, when I was in high school, we had to build a, a mouse trap car or something? Uh, no, nobody here? So essentially, uh, you, have to, you get a mouse trap and you have to use it to propel a car that you make. Um, and it's a fantastic exercise for older adolescents because now they get to use all this abstract creative So these are the four elements of the adolescent brain, and these are important. Each of these have upsides and downsides. But we're going to come back to these throughout. That first one, that increased drive for roller, the novelty seeking, this is probably um, at least in my opinion, one of the more important aspects of the Allison brain, not only for opportunity, but also vulnerability. Because when you are driven for a reward, you're looking for that next dopamine hit, you are going to be impulsive, you're going to be very susceptible to addiction, and you also have this, uh, what he terms, hyper-rationality. Uh, he also alluded to it as a positivity bias, so that's Essentially, adolescents really only focus on the good things of the decision that they're about to make and not necessarily the bad things. Like those tattoos that are definitely a good idea when you used to start college, and then later you're like, mm, maybe it wasn't a good idea. But these three areas, the impulsivity, the susceptibility to addiction, and this positivity bias, um, are again, are great to help motivate the kid out, seek uh, new experiences, drive for pleasure, reward, connect with your friends, go out, grow, develop, but also uh, pose, a, pose a concern. So, what is normal? Um, I had a couple of handouts, actually. Can I speak to them? They're on the back table here. Again, I was getting excited yesterday and I emailed Monica. I'm sorry, it's just too late. I just to include this. Uh, you guys don't need to reference it now, but I'm going to reference it. I'm going to talk a little bit today uh, about dialectical behavior therapy, DBT. It's a great evidence-based treatment for emotion dysregulation. Um, Alec Miller is a psychologist on the East Coast, um, really one of the early pioneers of adolescent DBT. Um, he's got this great handout in his skills manual for parents. It essentially says, hey, what is typical? And what is maybe not so typical? So increased moodiness, typical. Not so typical, intense, painful, long-lasting moods, depression, self-injury, suicidal thinking, etc. So this is a fantastic resource. Uh, I use it frequently in my treatment. I'll pay you back to that. But we've got a whole list of uh, all of these elements that really exist on spectrum. Everything's ramped up in adolescence. We've got those neural circuits that are firing in looking for those, those dopamine hits, and so everything's going to be ramped up. So that's to be expected. Okay, so that was crash course in adolescent brain development. Got it? <laughs> dopamine, just remember that. Dopamine, impulsivity, drive for reward, social interaction. That's what we learned. So, um, when I was asked to do team mental health, 
I thought I would take uh, a snapshot of where our current teams are today. Um, and I've been more and more drawn to this research of uh, Jean Conley. She is at uh, San Diego State University. Um, she does generational research. Um, so looking at, uh, she first started with uh, the Gen Xers, the Gen X, and then had a book on uh, millennials, and it's called uh, Me Generation. Um, she uh, just published um, a great book um, speaking about the newest generation, where she's speaking the internet generation, iGen, um, and she has all this great data. So I thought, what better way to give you a snapshot of her adolescence and mental health than to eventually copy all of her charts and put them in my chart? So these are hers only. So as I mentioned, she's looking at, uh, at generations doing generational research. Um, certainly we're all familiar with the baby boomers, and everybody has a different idea on what generational cutoffs, what dates or cutoffs uh, for each generation. Um, so there is no hard and fast, there's no definitive uh, numbers, it's all theoretical. Um, but gen baby boomers can be roughly described to have been born between 46 and 64, Gen X between 65 and 79, the millennials, most, uh, I thought the most recent, but she's suggesting perhaps even a newer generation. Uh, 1984. And she is uh, introducing what she's calling the I Gen A generation, uh, being born in 1995, 2012. She makes a lot of good arguments as to uh, these cutoffs, and I won't go into them uh, today. But there are a few key points key events that have occurred in our adolescents' lives that we um, cannot ignore uh, their impact on their, on their mental health. The iPhone came out in 2007, first iPhone. I remember getting the first iPhone, it was awesome. I had one of those uh, Blackberries before. And uh, big and clunky, full keyboard, that was a cool thing, I could write writing and all this, et cetera, but the iPhone kind of blew it away. Uh, 2010, the iPad was introduced. So now you have uh, a giant iPhone, which is a tablet. And by 2015, according to the US market uh, survey, two out of three teens in America owned an iPhone. That is some good marketing. That is probably an exaggeration. Uh, so these three events really uh, became hallmark features of this of our current generation. Uh, this is the first generation to not know no internet, to have never been without internet. I used to tell my clients that, yeah, when I was, well, I was a teenager, there was an internet. So what do you mean there was an internet? I kept telling them there's no sun. Right? Like, How is that possible? How did you talk to people? Like, On the phone? This phone? Um, yeah, our first email address, I think it was in college. And, uh, you know, these kids are, uh, are born with Facebook accounts, born with Instagram accounts. Uh, I've got plenty of friends that, um, who've created their own accounts for their, their new children. Uh, I'm not saying that's bad, I'm not going to condemn, I'm not for or against. Your kids have? Not yet, okay. <laughs> so that's, that's good. I could actually condone that. <laughs> Um, but this is a this is a new generation. So, uh, as I mentioned, Dr. Uh, Dr. Twain looks at these four data sets. And this is public information. Uh, the data is online. You can look it up. Um, she took the data from these big four uh, polling data sources, and these uh, these polls have been going since uh, the mid '70s. Uh, all the answers are totally anonymous, um, and we're looking at longitudinal data, so data over time. Okay. So this is, this is really the best way to look at generational movements. Uh, so if you're interested, you can look them up. It's all online. She's doing fantastic research down there at San Diego State University. And here are some of the general trends. I thought I might, I thought I should have put one per slide. So I'll, I'll talk you through it. On the left, these are uh, the number of times going out without parents 
per week for high school seniors, 12th graders. So if you guys remember back when you were a senior, you probably get out of the house at all costs, anytime you can, so it's for me. Um, but you see declining and going out. On the right is number of dates per week for high school seniors. So that's down a little bit, less than one at this point. So they're going out less than once a week on a date. So going out with parents is down, decreases in dating. Uh, also, there's a big decline in teen pregnancy. Not surprisingly, they're not going out, they're not dating. Uh, less than being pregnant, so that's good. We're also seeing uh, downward trends in general independence. On the left, this is my driver's license. Yes. Percentage of 12th graders with a driver's license. Um, and this is really fun. And this is looking at uh, the, that bottom line is uh, in city areas. So it's got city and rural areas. So across the board, it's going down. On the right, hours per week uh, spent working. So either paid or unpaid. So in high school, who here had a job in high school? I remember my first job. Um, I think it's 15. Um, yeah, across the board, jobs are going down. So teams are um, are driving less, working less. Homework. Homework is on the left, and this is by grade. So you've got uh, college, 12th, 10th, and 8th graders. Um, across the board, you see a downward trend. It's not as dramatic as the other ones. You can see a little bit of an uptick for 10th graders during the end. Um, but for the most part, every single one is going down. Teams are spending less time doing more, less time studying. On the right are the extracurriculars. So that is um, sports, volunteering, of that nature, that's more or less the same. And in fact, you actually see an uptick in volunteer. Probably because I think most universities now really uh, weight that heavily uh, for applicants. Um, so that one's fairly stable. And these are my alcohol slides. Uh, teens are drinking less. And these are two different studies um, across the board. Um, it stands to reason. They're going out less, they're hanging out with their friends less, they're drinking less. Um, so that's good. So they're not going out with peers as much, they're not studying as much, they're not working as much, they're not driving as much, they're not drinking as much. What are our teens doing? I already gave it away. You guys know what I'm doing. Yeah, screen time. Screen time. So um, again, this is out of uh, today's research. Um, we've got uh, high school seniors on the left and eighth graders on the right. So high school seniors are spending more than two hours each day texting, two hours each day in addition on the internet or internet apps, uh, about an hour and a half with video games, half an hour of video chatting. So averaging just, just above six hours a day. Uh, eighth graders are not far behind, so about five hours a day. Yeah, that is your data. So if you think uh, what a 24-hour day, uh, you've got about 17 hours for sleep, school, homework, sports, etc. that leaves about six hours left in your day for leisure. And those leisure hours are filled with training. Um, my academic folks, um, good kick at this, I think. So, uh, well, it's a depressing kick, not a, not a positive kick. Uh, SAT scores, interestingly, have also uh, declined over the past uh, five years. Uh, since actually, since 2005, SAT scores have dropped 10 or plus more points on average in critical reading, math, and the biggest drop in writing. So we're seeing, uh, we're seeing an impact on academics in certainly the uh, there's been a big push in the classroom to try to uh, capture the attention of these students. Uh, do we try electronic books? Do we try tablets? Do we try uh, video? Um, we, uh, there's been some calls for publishers to uh, condense, uh, make the words bigger, 
uh, less convoluted, less points in the textbook, really trying to capture the attention. Um, actually, uh, I was on the phone with my mom this week. Uh, she was calling about her granddaughter. Um, and uh, she's a retired teacher, and I was uh, asking her about her experience. And she said, you know what's funny? She said, do you remember uh, watching uh, Reading the Rainbow? You guys remember that? Anybody remember that? With the water burden? That was like the highlight of the week, right? Like in the classroom, when like, the teacher's like, okay, we're we'll reading Rainbow. And they, and they plug in the, they wheel in the big TV with the VCR, and they plug in the, the cassette. Um, and the barber and has this, like, you know, this video on, uh, on a book that he's reading. And it's, he reads the book. Um, she was saying, my, my mom was saying that she was talking to a, a teacher friend of hers, and she was saying, yeah, they don't, they don't like reading Rainbow anymore. When they have the opportunity, hey, end of the week, Let's do reading rainbow. The kids say, ah, that's boring. Let's, can we do the iPads instead? So uh, it, it's impacting the classroom. So let's get back to uh, brain development. So we know that teens are spending less time with each other in person and more time online than teens did five years ago. Uh, so they're going out with friends less uh, in. Uh, in the 12th grade, <coughs> excuse me, 12th graders uh, staying home on the weekends with parents not having with friends has increased. So 8% to about you know, almost a fifth. High school seniors will stay home on the weekends with their parents. Uh, while percentages of 8th, 10th, and 12th graders will be together with friends nearly every day, has dropped from about from 45% to less than 30%. So we have almost half of teens uh, saying that they hang out with their friends mostly every day to now uh, less than a third. The chart on the right, this looks at the percentage of 8th, 10th, and 12th graders who spend an hour or more of leisure time alone nearly every day. So we see less time with peers, more time alone. Um, it's too bad these are so small because the years are on the bottom. And you can see, let's see, it says 2014, 2012, 2010, 2008. <laughs> so, what's that? 2007 is the iPhone. 2007 is the iPhone. And when did uh, smartphones become ubiquitous? Probably 2011 ish, 2012. Right, everybody had an like, iPhone 3 probably by then. More or less. Um, so there's, in, I'm not saying, uh, again, I want to caution you on this data. Um, as my stats professors always say, correlation is not causation. So just because two things relate to each other or correlate does not mean one cause the other. I'm just pointing out the, I'm just pointing out the, the correlating data. <coughs> so. This is important because if we have teens spending less time in interactions with uh, their peers or with others and more time alone, they're missing out on that crucial adolescent brain development time. Right? When we think back to that slide, the Siegel slide, there's four things, novelty seeking, social engagement, these are all big drives for the human uh, adolescent brain to grow and develop. Well, if they've got this drive for novelty seeking, dopamine hits, uh, there's not with friends, where are they getting that? And two, if they're not with friends and not getting that social engagement piece, this is going to have um, this is going to have some uh, developing concerns on social skills. Uh, certainly, adolescents. Uh, Dean and I were just talking. Adolescents are um, ill-equipped when they go to college to navigate social relationships, um, kind of job interviews, um, going out on dates, even asking somebody out. So teens are less likely to take part in every single face-to-face -face social activity measured across all four of those data sets, across all three age groups. And that includes small group gatherings, one-on-one -on -one hangouts, large activities like parties, um, activities that have no real purpose, like cruising around in a car, driving around. Like, what my mom used to say, looking for trouble. <laughs> what are you doing? You're driving around looking to get in trouble. Yeah, it's the human brain development, Mom. That's normal. That's normal. 
Uh, and things like uh, movies and malls. All these are down. In fact, more teens today spend 10 or plus hours a week on the internet than having just four face-to-face -face social interactions in a week. And those are these activities that I've put up. Oh, um, my chart moved around. Okay, so. <clears throat> What impact is this having on mental health? That's what we're here to talk about today. So this is looking at 10th graders. Um, this is 20 years research taken from uh, that data set monitoring the future. In fact, every uh, screen activity, TV, texting, computer games, social networking sites, and internet, those are on the bottom, those are the black bars going to the right. Yeah, right? So that's going to increase risk. The bigger the bar, the greater the risk. And this is looking at risk for uh, self-reported unhappiness. So these are teens reporting unhappiness and the correlations between screen time. So again, from top down, TV, texting, computer games, social networking sites, and internet. The bars going to the left are activities that decrease risk of unhappiness. Okay, so those are good. Um, at the top, sports or exercise. Next is religious service. After that is in-person interaction. Then print media. Print media, which by the way is dying. Right? Our uh, generation is not doing print media. Uh, working homework even is uh, just slightly better. A slightly <laughs> increased risk of unhappiness. Um, but the takeaway is all screen activities are related to We can't really talk about screen time without talking about social media. Uh, and this is the especially insidious part of uh, our screen time. Uh, social media, just like Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, whatever, so you can post pictures or videos, see what people are doing, you can like things, you can comment things. Um, in seven years, uh, social media went from being, this is a quote of a Chinese book, uh, from being a daily activity of half of teens to almost, a day of almost all of them. Uh, especially true for girls. So 87% of uh, high school senior girls reported using social media sites almost every day. 77% uh, of boys did. Um, and so this social media uh, Influence is not always good. Um, I call it uh, the pursuit of likes right? because you've got these, uh, especially these teen girls who are posting pictures or taking an excessive amount of pictures to get the right picture to post the picture so that they can get a like or a comment or recognition from somebody else. And each of these alerts or likes are little dopamine hits, right? This is why we like our iPhones. I have a text of 15, I heard it right now. Everybody got a little bit of dopamine, so thank you, whether I have your phone on. this going. And every time you get that little light, you get that little dopamine hit. That feels good. That's reinforcing. That's also potentially addicting, right? And, uh, adolescents, especially adolescents, have the susceptibility to addiction, and they're susceptible to those activities that produce a lot of dopamine for a high pleasure, high reward. So, Social media has that propensity. Um, however, it's not a, always a true depiction. Um, I read some interviews of, um, I guess you call them stars, social media stars, social media figures, um, who were adolescent girls and later said, I believe it maybe because um, it wasn't real, that that carefree happy Sam's photo of me at the mall was actually staged and posed and I took like 45 pictures and I adjusted just so. But uh, teens, especially teen girls, are presenting only this uh, fictional positive life. It's all, it's all smiles and happiness. Um, interestingly, social media is a double-edged sword because it does foster social engagement. Right, that's the whole purpose. It's called social media. So you are interacting with and engaging with peers more through social media. 
but it's not that face-to-face -face interaction, right? It's through a screen. And I don't know how well you all are at reading irony or emotion in texts or emails, um, but if you're only getting uh, cryptic texting and poorly written text with not whole words and faces and emojis in it, um, it's, it's even harder to pick up on the subtle nuances and cues that really foster the social interaction and social engagement process with the adult. Okay, so looking at social media and screen time, our eighth graders, our youngest teens, are the most susceptible to this. And it makes sense, right? Because their brain is more in development than our older teens. Our older teens are on their way to, you know, through pruning and rounding and all that good stuff. Whereas our younger teens are still, right? So they may not have the uh, sophistication or the nuance to, to know that perhaps this is not a real or a uh, totally valid interaction. In fact, the risk of unhappiness and depression due to social media abuse uh, is high for the United States. Eighth graders who spent 10 or plus, uh, 10 or more hours per week on social networking sites were 56% more likely to be unhappy and increased their risk of depression by 27%. So, if you think about that for a minute, more than 56% more likely to be unhappy. If you're doing an activity that's 56% more uh, like to make you unhappy, you think you probably would stop doing it. Uh, but not so with, with the teenage brain. We're working against brain development here. It's, it's the brain is primed for this and it's latched on to this. Uh, risk of depression goes up uh, as well. Uh, oh, here on the slide for eighth graders, uh, homework made the cut to go to the right. So homework is increasing risk of unhappiness for eighth graders. So. <laughs> Um, here's just a, a chart I had, a, I had to throw in. This is looking at rates of uh, depression, uh, depressive symptoms um, amongst 8th, 10th, and 12th graders. And you see that big inclination, big incline rather, the big uh, rise in those percentages. Uh, I think that corresponds, if I remember correctly, right around 1 to 11. Okay, so you see depressive symptoms going down. Until about 2011, and they're going up. Again, correlation is not causation, but it's pretty uncanny. So, if depression rates are going up, um, we have to talk about suicide. Suicide is certainly a symptom of depression and, and obviously a high risk concern for adolescents. Uh, teens who spend more than three hours a day on their device are 35% more likely to have at least one suicide risk factor. Uh, those suicide risk factors are uh, feeling very sad and hopeless for two weeks, seriously considering suicide, making a plan to commit suicide, or having attempted to commit suicide. Those are the risk factors. So three hours a day, you have probably 35% chance more likely to have one of those. The risk really starts to increase at about uh, two hours a day. So if you get more than five hours a day, your risk is considerably higher to have uh, one of those suicide factors. So if it starts around two, that might suggest that moderation is the key. Again, I'm not here to say all cell phones and screen time is bad. There's sort of some of the inequalities, uh, but the takeaway from this one is moderation. Um, the not so pleasant uh, side effect of uh, screen time and social media is uh, explosion of cyberbullying. So uh, cyberbullying is especially insidious because you don't have to do it in person. You can hide behind the screen and be a bully. You can hide behind the you, you can be totally anonymous and, and bully. Um, this is especially difficult for adolescent girls whose preferred form of aggression is social aggression. So think about that would be mean girls. You guys all know it, aren't, aren't that, you know what? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, boys, uh, a little more primitive, not as smart as girls. Uh, for a lot of most men, it's more verbal uh, aggression. Uh, girls, uh, smart, uh, social aggression. So they can team up, essentially, um, and ostracize um, other teens socially, which is actually detrimental. 
Uh, 66% of those cyberbullying teens had at least one suicide risk. That's more of, I guess, more than 10% for victims of just good old fashioned in person bullying. One interesting positive data point that came out of this research is that teen homicide rates have declined steadily since 2007. It's unfortunate suicide is up, homicide is down. Uh, if you think about it, if you're spending less time with people, more time alone, and a screen, it's harder to commit homicide. Here's my uh, suicide rates uh, per 100,000. Um, 2007 was the lowest dip on both lines. The top line is 15 to 19 year olds. The bottom line is 12 to 14 year olds. Both uh, increased after 2007. Um, in fact, uh, three times as many 12 to 14 year old girls committed suicide in 2015 than in 2007. Three times in the last uh, years, or that year span. Overall, 46% more suicides in 2015. So uh, it's definitely something that's concerning that we need to pay attention to. I've got two more depressing slides, and then we'll go into what we can do. Sleep. Sleep is super important. Um, I really recognize that now as a father of a four-month-old. Um, I don't get much sleep anymore. Um, on the plus side, there's no problem for me to be down here early today. I was up and ready to go. I think about four or five, yeah, I think it's when the wake up call started. Um, we all need sleep. In fact, sleep is really important for our brain and our bodies. We all know that. Um, our brains release toxins, and shed toxins throughout the day, and sleep really serves as kind of the cleanup mechanism for that. Helps kind of restore brain functioning, also helps restore health functioning. So it's important stuff. Teenagers who are uh, going through this synaptogenesis and then this printing and myelination, a lot of brain stuff, it takes a lot of energy, it takes a lot of emotion, they need a lot of sleep. Really, they should be getting at least nine hours of sleep. Uh, and there's been calls for uh, schools uh, to start later, um, and that's a policy issue that I don't want to hear on another lecture. Um, but what we're seeing on the left, this is the percentage of 8th, 10th, and 12th graders who get less than seven hours of sleep to most nights. Uh, girls are the top line, boys are the bottom line. The percentage on the left, at the top is 50%, so it goes down by 10. It's 50, 40, 30, 20. No, 50, 45, 40, 35, 30, 25, 20. So the bottom is 20%. So uh, girls in 1991 started out just under 30% of girls were getting less than seven hours, and now they're about 47% almost half. Teens that spend more than three hours on electronics are 28% more likely to get less than seven hours. And we know this children who uh, use a device before bed sleep less, they sleep more poorly, and are more likely to sleep the next day. Self efficacy and self esteem. So, this chart, um, I did my, uh, I have some research publications on self efficacy, so when I saw this graph, I had to grab onto it. Um, this chart looks at the top line is self-competence, the bottom line is self-liking, and this is, uh, these are scores, uh, like liking scores zero to five. Five is, yeah, awesome. Zero is uh, awful. Uh, and these are averages across uh, from 19, 1989 on the far left to about 2015. So you see that big drop off 2012. So we have teens who are uh, feeling less confident and like themselves less. Um, my research really uh, found this link uh, or strengthened the link between self perceived self efficacy in adolescence and two things positive family relationships 
the perceived social support with peers. And that's really what mediated self-efficacy beliefs. We know that self-efficacy, self-efficacy is the belief that you can do something. Um, you can think of uh, that children's book, uh, The Little Engine That Could, right? You think I can? I recite all the children's books now. That's another side effect. Um, so I think I can, self-efficacy beliefs, those uh, develop in childhood from interactions with a supportive environment, but also one that's challenging. So I, I had given a speech to another school district on the perils of helicopter parenting, and we talked about uh, self-efficacy. If you want to develop self-efficacy in your kids, don't helicopter parents, challenge them, but also be supportive. So we're seeing self-efficacy down. Um, a lack of self-efficacy in adolescence has been associated with depression, anxiety, avoidance, substance abuse, risk of sexual behaviors, and eating disorders. So we want to see self-efficacy. Okay, those were all the current. I not only gave you the depressing stats, there's plenty of other good stuff too. There's some good ones in there. Alcohol use is down, anti pregnancy is down, all this kind of stuff. But we're, we're really at crossroads in terms of uh, adolescent mental health, and I, and I think it really can be ignored much longer. Um, and in fact, I, as I was getting excited about putting this together last night, uh, my wife yelled in the other room, hey, you need to get out of here. And I, I thought something was wrong with the baby. Uh, no, she was watching TV, and uh, there was a news story about two big Apple investors who are now calling for Apple to educate and provide assistance, training, et cetera, for parents and families so that kids do not become addicted to iPhones. These are Apple investors with, uh, I think, uh, two million worth or two billion, no, million or billion, I don't know, Apple so rich. There's a lot of money uh, these investors had, um, and they actually published a uh, call to Apple uh, in a letter uh, with uh, a school department's group and I was reading through it last night, also uh, noted was Gene Twain, who I just presented. Um, so we're really at a crossroads here. Uh, we need to start coming up with some strategies um, to facilitate positive mental health growth. growth. It could start with just putting down the phone. Um, so the lesson from the research really indicates if you're a parent, put off giving your kid a smartphone as long as possible, especially with cyberbullying, social media, links to depression, suicide, uh, avoidance, lack of independence, and go on and on. Put off as long as possible. In fact, um, I believe somebody was interviewing Steve Jobs years ago, uh, so that the iPad came out, and they said, oh, I bet your kids love this iPad. And he said, they don't need to use the iPad. We really want to try to use our own. Steve Jobs said that. He created the iPhone and the iPad. Uh, in fact, uh, what's that? Bill Gates does the same thing. Bill Gates, uh, co-founder of Twitter, editor of Wired. You've got all these big tech CEOs who don't let their kids use electronic devices. Because they know. They're on something. I saw a quote, I think, in Twangy's book that said, uh, don't get high on your own supply. <laughs> They're disregard. So, uh, put it off. Um, you can consider the use of uh, dumb phones or what I had as a phone, those are little Nokia flip phones. Um, oh my gosh, I gotta go fast. So, um, you know, the phones that when you text somebody, you hit the same button like 18 billion times, and it's all over. Um, so, think about that. Monitor social media, especially photo sharing. Uh, not all screen time is bad. We want to limit to about uh, an, hour, an hour a day if possible. You can use tech to limit tech. Like apps, there's plenty of apps that lock uh, devices, lock apps, lock internet. Teach self-management. I think I saw in your notes, D, self-management. Good, so I don't even touch it. <laughs> Ask D, she knows. Um, we want to increase social interaction. That's going to be the big key piece. That's my message today. More social interaction for teens. That means parents need to loosen the grips a little bit on the restrictions. Maybe loosen the curfew a little bit. We don't want our kids at risk, but we want our kids to get out there, seek novelty, explore social relationships, insist on their independence, perhaps make them get a driver's license, or at least say, I'm not driving here right anymore. Um, Stream free routines at home. When I was a teenager at dinner, we all had to sit down at the same time. 
we couldn't leave until everybody left. We didn't have screens, but I would get a phone ring out of the room, and I'd it's like, nope, it's their time. Just sit and wait. And I'd sit and wait, and the answering machine would kick on, and you'd hear my friends say, hey, we do. Couldn't answer the phone right there. Uh, sleep hygiene. I'm not going to go into depth here. I think you guys uh, all have a good understanding of what constitutes good sleep hygiene. Uh, go to bed at the same time, wake up at the same time, limit devices, get exercise, don't drink coffee before bed. Yeah, common sense. Thing. Treatments. I've got a couple minutes left to go over these treatments. I want to talk about two treatments in particular for our adolescents CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, and DBT, dialectical behavior therapy. CBT, strong evidence over 300 clinical trials, uh, focuses on the present, time limited. This is right off of, uh, this is from Judy Beck. Judy is the daughter of Aaron Beck, who created cognitive therapy. Um, CBT is predicated on this idea that how we think and react is, is based on uh, how we think, how we perceive situations. This is a typical CBT treatment on your left for adolescent depression. These are the modules I would hit on in my treatments. Psychoeducation on what is depression, what's the treatment. Safety planning, if there's any concern for suicidality. Coping skills, in particular, the number one coping skill for depression, behavior activation. Get up, get out, go do something. Don't sit at home by yourself on the computer, go to the gym, walk the dog, go hang out. Cognitive restructuring, started looking at some of the cognitive interventions, and then you can start generalizing all these things in, in uh, behavioral experiments. Excuse me. And lastly, conclude with social skills training, because people who are depressed have uh, decreased social skills. They're not out doing things. The role of parent in CBT is paramount. The role of parent in any treatment for adolescents is paramount. Um, I used to always try to pull in parents when I was uh, in practice. Working with parents makes treatment work. A lot of parents don't want to hear that they have to come in and do treatment for their kid. But as I was talking with Eric, when you have a child or teen patient, you actually have like three or four patients. You've got the patient, the, the teen, the mom, the dad, the relationship, the whole family sometimes. Um, we need parents' help. Safety planning and behavior activation with parents to interact with their kids more. In the last couple slides, DBT. Um, I was the uh, project manager for a uh, large randomized control trial of DBT for adolescents. Marshall Lenahan, who created DBT at the University of Washington, wanted to see in the data that DBT worked for kids. And so we just finished that five year trial years ago, we're just now getting the data out. Data looks good. Looks like uh, things across the board came down. Um, looking at uh, decreases in suicide mitigation, self-injury, attempts, dysregulation, and depression. The DDT was originally created for uh, borderline personality disorder. Uh, really, it's been adapted to emotion dysregulation. So that's the inability to regulate emotions, also known as Adolescents. Right? Again, we know the adolescent brain are all over the place, they're doing things, they need help, they need tools to regulate these emotions in a way that are uh, safe and helpful and not dangerous, like drinking, drugs, promiscuity, running away, cutting, the usual systems. So, this is uh, on the left is uh, the elements of DBT. We've got skills training. Uh, where you can actually explicitly teach parents and teens these coping skills, individual psychotherapy with the kiddo, in the moment phone coaching, that's 24 7 on the phone coaching to help generalize those skills to teens because teens are dysregulated and they've forgotten everything that they, you talked about in your 50 minute session in your cushy office last week when they're out with their friends. Oh, also, dopamine, neural circuits, seek for uh, reward, increases when you're with peers natural. So you're more likely to do stupid stuff when you're with your friends as an adolescent than by yourself. So in the moment of fun coaching is key. And again, the role of the parent is paramount. We need the parent's support to not only teach and generalize the skills, but also my other handouts 
Uh, validation, probably the single most important skill a parent can learn for their team is how to validate their experience in a way that's believable. It's not invalidate the experience. So all you have to say is, I understand what you are feeling makes sense. I don't agree that you took my car and crashed it, but I can understand why you would want to take my car and go see your friends. I understand that that's exciting, and you're also in big trouble. But the validation piece is important. And well, this handout is just an easy handout. This is a, the please skill. This is out of Marshall Lenningham's adult PBT skills book. These are just five simple things that you could do each day, especially important for kids to keep the body happy, uh, to treat physical illness, balance eating, don't uh, avoid mood altering substances, including caffeine. I would also say maybe uh, screen time. Uh, balance sleep, get exercise. And the very last slide, I want to go over it. I took this out of Dan Siegel's uh, book. Uh, is that a lesson book? Try to embrace the essence. Uh, this is his attempt at uh, creating a, a nice acronym. But those four areas are those four areas of brain development that we talked about at the beginning. The novelty seeking driver reward, he calls emotional spark. Honor that internal sensation that are more intense during adolescence. Social engagement, encourage important connections that we have with others. And novelty, seeking out and creating new experiences that engage us fully, stimulating our senses, emotions, thinking, and bodies. So not just on the screen time, perhaps let's go outside, let's go do something. And the last one is creative exploration. Except for thinking about abstract reasoning, helping them think outside of the box. Okay, I think that's it, thank you very much. We'll take the next 10 minutes to take a break. If anybody needs to use the restroom, they'll be back here. We have the water and the coffee outside. We also, again, the next portion of the symposium is going to be the question and answers. So we have cue cards in the back, um, where if you have any questions uh, for any of the people on the panel, whether it's substance abuse, whether it's uh, you know from a primary care, how the providers deal with it, how the school board is addressing issues, or any of the medications that maybe you have questions on, um, feel free to write those down. We'll go through them, and then the next 45 minutes, we'll go through those, OK? Thank you. <laughs> OK, so, so hopefully uh, this, this will be the really fun portion of the symposium where we all get to interact together and have a more of a discussion uh, style and get out to everyone's family and friends. Um, so we'll, we'll go through some of the questions uh, here, and if anybody has any more, you can go ahead and bring them up, or if not, we can maybe just have another mic and just start talking to each other. So uh, first question here is, uh, how do you select a, uh, select a dual diagnosis treatment facility for a teen? If there is substance abuse with the depression, is teen treatment and care the only choice? And is there a team of younger adults, A or NA? So that's everybody on the panel would like to. I can put them one at a time. So the, the first one is how do you select a dual diagnosis treatment facility for a team? Okay. Um, and if, yeah, you can put one, turn it on, then turn it off. Oh, okay. Um, there are uh, quite a few facilities that, refer, that we do refer to. Um, most of my patients um, are Medi-Cal patients or cal patients, which is basically the same entity. And um, the problem isn't as much referring as the time that it takes to get them into the referral. Because we have um, Children's Hospital of Orange who they have a psychological service that they refer to. We have a hotline for cal optima that we can call, and then there's um, Visa. If anybody wants a list, let me know and I'll get you the list. But there's Pepperdine University Counseling Center, Orange County Mental Health, Group Pilgrimage Counseling, Community Counseling Center. There's about 10 or 12 counseling centers that we can send them to. But again, the, the problem is, that is the time element. And then the other problem is parents following through. Because we may find a problem, but the parents don't agree with our assessment. So sometimes, um, and the other problems, we see children from so many different cultures. 
And so counseling and problems like this may be acceptable in one count, uh, culture and they understand, but another culture is going to say, you know, my child has no problems, there's nothing there. So then it becomes um, more difficult for the referrals. But um, the primary thing is, is getting them into the referral center um, as soon as we can. And if it's urgent, then we can't put urgent or emergency if we suspect that, you know, they might be suicidal or something. I don't know if Dr. Sally is there any substance abuse, if there is substance abuse repercussions in in uh, patient treatment care the only choice? Well, when it comes to selecting treatment, really there's no any one anything for just the very off the bat. Uh, especially in the, in the case of adolescents and teens where you know, you may not have a focus actually on medication-based type of treatments that you will see more so in, in, in adults. So really, the, for the times that I've had to refer people to different types of uh, programs, really it's dependent on that individual 100% of the time. Uh, whether that's the values of the family, whether, you know, I've had kids that go to, uh, say, like a recovery ranch type of place for several months if they're very, very severe. But, uh, you know, it's, it's changing. Some of that's changing. I've, I've had uh, patients as young as 10 years old that have been exposed to uh, heroin smoking heroin uh, from older siblings. Um, and so we're, that, that's being pushed down, the acuity of that person, you know, the younger folks that we're seeing that have dependence that normally we didn't normally associate, the younger groups with having dependence type of things, uh, where that's, we're seeing that a bit, a bit more. Uh, but there's no one way, and so it really depends on what, what you're seeing. So uh, unfortunately, when I get to see uh, a lot of the, the patients that I see, the medical side is kind of trumping things at that, just at that moment. So they might have abscesses on their arm from inject, injecting heroin, let's say, or methamphetamine. They may be losing their teeth. They may have um, engaged in risky sexual behavior, or you know, the the risk-taking behaviors that were described already are amplified to a level that you might not even just, I mean, it just it can blow your mind uh, the degree to that risk-taking. And so, um, so really, the needs of where you send somebody that depend on that distillation. Uh, everything from family values and you know, most of the time, the, one of the biggest things that you know that's a challenge when we're looking at initial evaluations is also the family. So there's a lot of dysfunction in families, and so you know everything from follow through, but it can actually be sometimes a family can be the source of a huge component of this. And, and easily two thirds of the patients that I've seen um, a lot of early childhood uh, traumatic events, and sometimes the family can be the source of it. So really it's an individual type of thing that you need to look for placement. Uh, and it's confusing, and we have a very poor system in the United States, and um, there's some, you know, there are people right now that are trying to make improve that. You know, there's websites like SAMHSA that looks at, you can have a, there's a guide that you can go and filter through to be able to look for uh, resources to, to have people, you know, whether that's, if you're filtering by gender, by age, by uh, need, dual diagnosis or not, um, and, and then, but it's still confusing. So, you know, one of the things that I, uh, you know, if you have access to people that can help as navigators, some places do have that, you know, sometimes peer support specialists, that are people that may be in recovery themselves that can help, that can be always an asset as well. Uh, so there's no one way, and, uh, and generally, you know, it's an individual type of uh, evaluation each time. Kind of along that same line, uh, today the data stated that there's been a decrease in alcohol use among our teenagers. Would you say that the data is similar for other drug use, and, um, especially in areas such as this that may be considered a little bit more affluent? So, Drug pattern, or drug use pattern can be very regional. Like, uh, you know, what's happening in Ohio, for example, where people are dying of fentanyl use that's spiked uh, opioids. So opioids are, right, they're, they're the ones that you probably, you open up the newspaper and you see something about an opioid. An opioid really is just a class of a medicine or, or a drug that comes from the poppy seed of you know, op opium. And we, of course, have a problem in the United States where we consume about 95% of all the world's hydrocodone, which is one of the most common uh, forms of opioid, uh, and that's trickling down to the, to the younger folks. And so, really it's regional. So like here, 
In this area, for example, if I treat patients, I might have a higher prevalence of people, uh, you know, young folks that have had access to prescription drugs. So if you think you didn't need to lock up your, your, your cabinets, your medicine cabinets, you're wrong. Sometimes the first place is they go visit grandpa, and grandpa's from the depression era time, and he doesn't throw away anything. He's got 10 bottles of Vicodin that he never threw away from all the times he's hurt his knee. You know? And so a lot of times they'll, they'll, they'll grab those and they'll start experimenting. And we've had situations even where there's uh, you know, parties where kids will bring pills, they'll dump them into a bowl, they mix it up, and there's a combination of benzodiazepines and opioids or whatever it is. Again, part of that risk taking. If I were in somewhere like, say, uh, maybe a little less affluent, like in Long Beach, where I had a clinic there too, um, it just switches from maybe a prescription drug to heroin. From Adderall, a stimulant, that can be because you have access to psychiatrists or access to, you know, because they have insurance, to maybe an area where maybe they don't have insurance, but they may have access to methamphetamine. It's cheaper. Okay, these are the different patterns. And, and there's actually a stream. There's a lot of good studies. We, we try to track where it's happening. In this area still, if you look at the, the pattern of deaths um, and you were to highlight a heat map, the whole coast would light up from Dana Point all the way up to, to Long Beach. And part of the reason is because we have a disproportionate number of treatment facilities where people are coming from like Wisconsin. And they're coming here and they're like, this is nice weather. And they don't leave. And they might have gone through a 28-day program in Costa Mesa but they don't leave necessarily, and they think, oh, I have my 12-step community here. But you know what? It's tough for people that are doing well and earning a lot of money to live in this area. Oftentimes, they have other socioeconomic issues and all those other determinants of health become an issue. And so we end up having that when people relapse, a lot of uh, difficult situations that are sort of disproportionately show the, the morbidity and mortality of people dying and having other issues in this area, which is very, very high. Uh, <clears throat> Harry, I think this one's directed specifically towards you. Uh, what is the school board's thought on teen mental health, and what is the plan to address it? On teen alcohol? Okay. I think you said teen mental health. Yeah. Mental health. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, we have read some of this. This was fascinating, all the information from Keegan. And we are trying very hard to address it. We, last year, we started a social emotional learning program for K-5. We know that there were 213 studies, I think, of 270,000 children that told us that social emotional learning actually brings up achievement gains by 11%, meaning GPA and test scores. We also want to educate the whole child. But for a long time, we were so focused on testing with no child left behind that we started leaving out help. And we started taking out art. We started taking out music. We took out social studies in a lot of cases. So kids didn't have outlets. We weren't giving them any social skills. And now we realize that it's going to help them academically, but we know we have to help the whole child. We also spent money hiring a new director of social emotional learning that's helping us a lot. And we're, this year, for the first time, we're doing a universal screening of all children K-12 to try to figure out if a lot of the, the students that come out on top, we already know about. But the next tier down that are kind of in that gray area, struggling a little bit, so that we can jump in there and help them before it gets worse. And we're also really trying to look at kids' assets, like at Thurston, it, they have a wheel, and as part of the wheel, they're looking, uh, they're looking at their strengths. And we're finding that that's really helping the students, not at the very top, I think they're good at everything, but the students that are down a little bit, hearing that, hey, this is a strength that I am compassionate and empathetic, and helping them build on those, not only for their own self-efficacy, but for looking towards jobs and so on. But we still have a lot to do. <laughs> Maybe I can extend it on that? Sure. I'm actually a very involved parent in the school.
school district is, is me and I were chatting. I have four kids in the district, and we have a parent um, as an uh, extension of uh, bringing in the new social emotional director. They're doing a parent forum um, in line with this parent, with this social emotional, and there's a group of parents that get together. Um, we're going to be meeting our third time, I think, in a couple of weeks. And we're looking at these different studies that they have, and we're looking at the studies that have come in that we've done in the district with the kids and the parents. Um, and then um, looking at what the district has done so far and looking at what could be done better and what um, if, what the kids are asking for, what the parents are asking for, and what things we can do to expand on that better and bring to the kids going forward. And some of the real things, we've actually had conversations in our house already of what was, is that great, is it not? how can we go forward as well. So being a parent on that committee uh, is one of the things that, uh, that we're taking from the district and the board and running with as well. Thank you, Sherry. And to add to that, we're also having a student focus group in the middle school and high school. So we can hear from students what they need and what helps them instead of just deciding from, from studies. Um, they mentioned the increase in the in depression uh, with the isolation uh, that, they're, that the data is showing. Is there an increase also in other mental health issues, whether it's like bipolar or schizophrenia that you're seeing as well in the office? I think that, <coughs> that um, we continue to see significant amounts of, of uh, teens with depression and the other conditions that you mentioned, uh, other mood disorders, bipolar disorders, uh, thought disorders, and, and especially two eating disorders that I spent a lot of time working with, uh, keep in touch on how, uh, you know, unrealistic uh, view of the way people are supposed to look and be tends to, to foster that. So. Also, I think it's important to note that with the increase in the use of stimulants, we see uh, bipolar conditions coming out sooner or coming out in individuals where it might not have come out, but, but does come out. Um, and it comes out sooner. Um, and again, with uh, drugs, we often see individuals who have a tendency toward a mood disorder or bipolar condition who think that, that marijuana helps them when the people around them can see that it, it makes the conditions worse. And uh, as, as Keegan mentioned, we were just talking beforehand about how, um, how detrimental it seems to be to social development for all the, the screen time that people have. One, one of the things that, that uh, I realized a few years ago is that we weren't really taught to ask about an internet history when you take a history. So if you don't don't ask, you may, may not find out that somebody's you know on their phone gaming eight hours a day. I, I guess this one's a, a little bit interesting because it takes the reverse role. Huh? How can we use social media for its appeal to reach out and inspire healthier, rewarding activities? I should be getting uh, paid by some of the social media uh, companies for this. Um, I'm not sure. That's that's not something I've, I've really looked at. Um, there was one. Uh, where did I see this comment? I think it was in. Um, I've been from Dan Siegel. Um, he was pointing out to uh, he was pointing out that adolescents, in their all-knowing um, being, um, don't typically like to be scared into tactics or told what this is bad. You shouldn't do it. Um, and he pointed to the anti-smoking campaign that's been going on. Uh, and I don't know if you've seen some of the commercials where they're really uh, targeting teens and they're essentially saying like, look, big tobacco is screwing you. They're stealing your money. Think about all, all the money you have to spend to uh, pay, for your pay for your cigarettes or your tobacco products, et cetera. You've seen them on TV. I think it's, they have like an asterisk. So it's like some sort of truth something. 
Um, that type of tact in terms of uh, marketing uh, works well with adolescents because all of a sudden now they're thinking abstractly, that creative uh, abstract thinking, and they're thinking, oh, wait a minute, I'm not being told by this authority figure this is bad. I'm, told, I'm getting this, the real scoop, and I'm going to make my own decision to not get into that. So I think you have to consider that line of thinking or conceptualization when using social media for pro-social gains. So there's like if there is a campaign for social media use, uh, certainly you could highlight all of the positive benefits for social media. Um, remember, adolescents are only going to pick up on the pros of their decision making more often than their cons, if that supports what they're going after. Also known as confirmation bias, right? We tend to only look at find things that support what we want to support. Uh, so if we think about uh, using that to an advantage and pointing out, well, these, these aspects of social media have helped. Um, I think these are all the feel-good stories on Facebook that you see, like reuniting lost family members or helping people in um, na uh, national or natural disasters, things of that nature. Um, I just don't know what type of platform that would be because the current platform where it's you know Snapchat and you can send funny pictures back and forth and they disappear, quote unquote, they disappear. You know, the teens say, oh yeah, there's no record of it, it disappears. Like, where do you think it disappears to? Like, where do you think it comes from? Do you know what a server is and how that's stored? Um, so what that platform looks like, I'm not sure, but certainly highlighting some of the pro-social benefits um, would be a way to start. <clears throat> this next question uh, deals a little bit with the current issue that I think all, anybody on the panel or multiple people can answer. Um, that asks, with the recreational use of marijuana now being legal for adults, how do you see that impacting the teens and how can we safeguard against that influence on them? So, for sure, you know, the, the law that was passed you know, theoretically does not include young people as far as legality, right? So just have the alcohol. Um, but we know kind of in California, at least, the experience of doing it, it's kind of been de facto accessible really everywhere. Um, however, there is good science to show that uh, the modeling that adults show to, to kids, you know, do, it does make a difference. So I think that what we're probably expecting here is for there to be a spike of increased use. Uh, we have, you know, as we're still kind of in an infant stage of understanding the, the changes that we, you know, that happen to people with with uh, with cannabis exposure. We have some pretty good science coming out now to show that the biggest effect really has to do in the adolescent stage. That's not so much in, the, in, in adulthood, and that was alluded to earlier. Uh, but it's, it can be quite impactful, and it's also affecting uh, periods when we're seeing like earlier like catching or maybe having a higher prevalence of, of, of people uh, having psychotic issues um, associated with cannabis use as well. So we're seeing that, and I can tell you, I used to uh, run a consult liaison service for substance abuse for a psych unit, and that was a common thing that we'd see as well, even though a lot, for a long time, actually if you go to the internet and do your Google searches, which is gonna be kind of treacherous, like if you talk about social media, um, there, are, um, there are groups that are organized even to talk about people that are using drugs on how to use drugs. Like, you know, uh, there's a whole other lexicon, dabbing. There's, all, it's just, there's a whole other way of devices that got created for cannabis use that's multiplied the concentration of what's now being, ex they're being exposed to compared to in the 60s, let's say, that it's just on another level, just a whole other level. So we can't even compare what we used to know about things back in the day because the cannabis is different. It's a whole different, it's, it's a different formulation. We're strand, genetics has, it has changed it. Um, but, but not only that, but just it's a lot of different things. So we're, as we study it, um, I, I would anticipate we're gonna get a spike. Uh, and then, um, and then we'll see. We're still seeing what's happening in Colorado. We're still seeing what's happening in Washington. Um, I can tell you that there are still a lot of people that are um, you know, concerned about the fallout from this. But the modeling, it matters. So to me, even by having it legal for adults, I think that it will still contribute to that spike. Someone uh, asked to please address brain mapping. Um, we recently saw uh, something on National Geographic that showed that the, uh, 
there was uh, the brain mapping uh, for uh, drugs and alcohol and video games all showed similar results. I don't know if anybody has any background on that. Uh, I don't have background uh, on brain mapping. I think I you know the gist of the question. Um, I also um, I attended a lecture by um, uh, Daniel. Uh, I always say Ahmed, but it's Aim. Okay, I always say Aim, but it's Ahmed. I always say the opposite. Um, he's the big ADHD guy, uh, and he's talk, he talked. He talked his on several different types of ADHD. He's big into the brain mapping, um, brain scans, and, and how that um, ADHD shows. Um, he had talked a lot about. Um, uh, dopamine rush and uh, a love for, not necessarily a romantic love, but um, a love for a teacher um, as a student. And that those students who um, had relational teachers who taught through using relationship skills and not necessarily just kind of a row x plus y equals z, um, that those kids learned more, they learned better, they learned faster. Um, and then he pointed to uh, the, limbic, the activation of the limbic system and uh, the connection with this increased dopamine and this kind of love uh, for the teacher. Um, when you talk about different parts of the brain lighting up, um, you're just talking about uh, which parts of the brain are active. Um, and certainly there's thousands of studies that will link different types of uh, brains lighting up for this and that. When you talk about, I believe the question was um, uh, drugs, alcohol, and video games. Video games. Video games. Um, so a lot of these work on the same kind of pathway, right? So these are, um, video games are extremely stimulating, they're immersive, um, they keep your attention, and uh, it releases dopamine. This is a, a, a pleasurable activity for most teenagers. Um, the same can be said for certain substance use, um, so getting, uh, releasing uh, different neurotransmitters, including dopamine, serotonin, etc. So you have some, some of the same neural pathways uh, implicated in that. Um, I think the question was, um, was the question how is this, how are they the same, or? Did, did I get, they had they similar, similar, area similar uh, areas were lighting up. For okay. Them. So I think, I think I answered that. Um, I've been thinking about um, the previous question and joining with uh, the previous question that I built and this question. Um, if we can link these opportunities together via social media or these social activities, if it's video games, um, a lot of the video games now have, you know, you're immersed in the environment and you're actually chatting with people, right? So there is some social element to that. Um, so that would be a good way to try to exploit more social interaction. Again, it's not face-to-face. -face, um, but this video game addiction, and I use the term addiction uh, loosely, um, can be exploited in a way to then foster more, I guess, face-to-face -face or video interaction. There's a couple apps now that are Google Hangouts, I think that's what it's called. Essentially, everybody just kind of sits in a video chat room. You can actually video chat with people. Um, it's a step closer to social interaction. But in many ways, this, to answer the original question, in many ways, the, it's the same uh, neural circuitry, the same pathway, uh, because it's the same reward system. I just wanted to add a little anecdote to when you were talking about relational teachers, and we had have all this emphasis on testing and so the big state tests come up and I can tell my class is really tense. And so I wanted to get them to calm down. I knew they'd do better. And I said, you know, I know that you guys are going to do the best you can, but just remember, I love you no matter what. And they did the best anybody had ever done. <laughs> it was just so, so we know that if they're they're calmer and feel secure, that we do better, all of us do. The last question is, uh, I think one in general, if, if uh, people in the community want to get, a, uh, get involved in helping the, the teams, whether it's the school or different community, um, is there any particular resources or communities that you recommend uh, that they explore? To 
to help with the community. Yeah. Was, who was it that was talking about the teen group? Uh, I think oh, Phyllis is about yeah. getting a teen center. Yeah, yeah so that, this is an area, like, so if, if you think about prior to, uh, I'm going to go back on my screen time rant, prior to the, to the screen time when you had more uh, teens getting out and doing things, um, engaging activities that didn't have a lot of purpose, like driving around, looking for travel, etc. cetera. Um, but also things um, like skate parks, that was big. It used to be big, I don't see very many anymore. Um, like skate parks are areas that are um, cool enough for teens, um, but that would, and that would entice um, adolescents to attend in person. So you had mentioned no teen wants to go to the Boys and Girls Club, that's not cool. And so trying to foster or create like a teen center, um, I probably caution calling it teen center because <laughs> I feel like I'm um, <laughs> No, our theory is that it would be a place that the teens run themselves, oversight, you know, by the community and the community as a whole. The city, the church, the parents, the schools, it has to be something that's supported by the whole community, not just, you know, not just an aspect of the community. And then it has to be run by the teens for the teens with oversight. So that they want to go there. And they set up the programs and they they make it cool. So yeah, so you need a lot of help setting that up, right? It's a big it's a tall order. So things of that nature, um, certainly um, Dee can echo this, but um, trying to foster, um, again, it's going to sound lame, but after school activities or activities where you already have a captive audience, um, and so if they're already at school, uh, perhaps getting into some sort of activity either on campus or near campus uh, that would foster that social interaction, that those would be my two much sure others think. Pam? Yeah, and um, another thing that we've found some success with is that we are. Um, we have our adventure club, so we're taking kids and teens out um, weekly that'll go rock climbing or local paintball shooting or just getting out and about and hitting those um, brushes, <laughs> um, but uh, pushing through the boundaries. And stuff. Yeah, those are fantastic. Uh, sports activities, again, are also going to be big. I think some of the data that I shared, uh, sports is a, is a big uh, risk buffer uh, to unhappiness and depression. Um, and it makes sense in terms of depression treatment. Um, I would always try to prescribe um, exercise to my depressed teens, uh, preferably with other people, because it, it hits on all the areas that make you feel less depressed. You've got social interaction, you got physical activity, you're outside, you're doing something, you usually have a sense of competency afterwards. Um, it's really like my cheater way of boosting mood, because we all know that once you physically exercise, that's going to release a lot of endorphins, and it's going to make you feel better. And you come back and say, I did feel better. I said, how did you know that? Well, I'm very smart. <laughs> but facilitating the sports activities or any sort of activity like that would also be paramount. And maybe including the arts, like having a place where kids could play instruments, or I was looking at that program called This Is Brave, that nonprofit where they do storytelling and they talk about actually about mental health struggles that they've had, uh, poetry or singing, and bringing that part out too really helps. You know, one of the things that we learned a long time ago during the Vietnam War was that, at least how, as, as it relates to things like addictions, um, is that when people came back, a lot of people came back actually on you know, having used heavy amounts of opioids in particular, like heroin, when they were there. So everyone assumed because they're dependent, dependence and addiction are the same thing, and uh, that they would all be living this life of somebody that has an addiction, which we can kind of, kind of put in our hand, which is a spiral down, right? But we didn't see that. We didn't. We actually didn't see that. And one of the one of the takeaways that maybe that you can you can come we'll come up with here, and you, you're all alluding to it, is that besides the you know, we have always this inclination to be very surgical and specific about what causes this, what do we intervene in. One of the biggest things that we continue to learn is that actually it, it comes back to the community, it comes back to the village, 
with the idea that actually we're really probably meant to be in little tribes and support each other, and that even with the same degree of what we would, in a, in a scientific approach, measure as pathology, that for some reason people do differently when they're exposed to that type of environment versus others. It's not a medication, okay, as much as that, I, mean, I study medications all day long, I'll tell you, it's not that, okay? And uh, so it actually matters, um, not so much the specific of the specific site, but the overall aspect of that community, and it does make a difference. And, and we don't know how, exactly how to explain it quite yet, but it's interesting to me that, you know, I have, when I went to business school, I did it in information technology, so I'm a certified propeller head. I like technology, I used to build them, you know, when I would build computers in my, in my, in my home. Um, and I can tell you that one of the things I'm finding myself that I'm doing is reverting back to the concept of you know, writing. You know, I try not to, to, to put it in, you know, digital form. Um, these are some of the things that, because it's, you know, you, you, you're feeling something, and then it, it, it lends to that connection. So that's, I think that something that we're going to see, and there's a really good TED talk on this, I forget who did it, it was somebody from Canada, who actually, his whole theory on addiction was actually that. And you know, it was a little bit, was actually controversial to what we now uh, understand addiction to be, and those neural pathways that we talked about as being a primary chronic disease. Um, but, um, but it still goes to show that really that's a huge component and can be underestimated. So when we approach things like teen uh, cannabis exposure, you know, that we incorporate school with the community, that, that there's this larger thing, not a center for cannabis treatment of teen teenagers. <laughs> we tried that and it didn't work, right? We tried for pregnant women that hey, if you're pregnant and you're on opioids or using other drugs or alcohol, there's going to be this place that you have you go to. Such and such recovery didn't work. You know where they wanted it? They wanted. They, we saw the research showing that the only ones that stuck around and showed up and went through their prenatal care were the ones that went to a place that was integrated in their medical home. Again, the concept of that totality, right? And, and, and so peer support specialists, it's, it's, it's not any one focus. So I, you know, I, I think that the, the Laguna Beach Community Clinic is, you know, um, perfect example of that and all the different ways that they're attacking the problem of wellness and exercise is brought up I just throw out there if anyone wants to talk to me about the nutrition is another really really important one that impacts mood and it's actually to a large degree more so than some medications I, I love what Dr. Mario was saying about the community and I was just thinking a while back I traveled to Comoros which is a little island nation between Madagascar and the Indian Ocean. And I met a young man who was doing his um, PhD thesis on the young men there. And when the men there turned 15, they were turned out of the home and they all went and lived together and helped each other build these little huts. So they were all living together in these little, little huts. They still went to school. They were allowed to come home and on Sundays and have family dinner and maybe their moms did their laundry, I don't know. But uh, they helped each other build and they said they had no mental illness in their community. And I just thought that was fascinating. I mean, I know we can't do that here with our kids, but it, it was very interesting. But I think it had a lot to do with that community and helping each other and feel, and feel good about what they were doing. And during that time, they really had reflected on who they were, and they wrote poetry, we heard some sing songs. So it's just an, an interesting way another place to us, teenagers. Mm -hmm. I ran out of cue cards with you, so unless anybody has any other questions? Just a statement that's just that, that occurred to me. Everything we're hearing, we're at all points. And this is probably true of adults to a certain degree, but certainly the teenagers who are finding themselves, they are looking for where they are needed. Where are they needed? What are they here for? What are they good at? <coughs> How can they help? What are they needed for? I think that's probably one of the biggest human motivators that certainly comes out in the teenagers. Where am I needed? What can help? You know, who needs me, and what for? Uh, including, Just a thought. Yeah, we're very fortunate uh, uh, to have a councilman Bob Whalen uh, come up and give a couple words before we close. Uh, so if I can have him come forward. Uh, 
Thank you, Marty. Um, I'm not sure why I'm here other than this is our room. <laughs> we have a meeting tonight, our first meeting of the year, but uh, I have to say that the most important meeting uh, that's going to occur in this room today is the one that you just participated in. Um, you know, the, the comments about community and support, I, I look around the room here and I realize we're very fortunate in Laguna to have a lot of support. I know Boys Girls Club is here, Gail's here from our Housing and Youth and Human Services Committee. The city is very supportive of these kinds of efforts. Um, and and the, the clinic, we've um, you know, been able to uh, provide some assistance to the clinic. And I just think the clinic is such a valuable resource to our community. Uh, Many aspects of our community, not just our team members, but um, uh, you know, the homeless people, um, the, the, the AIDS victims you know, over the years, they've done so much for the HIV. Um, it's a resource that is unique. Every community should have something like it. If they don't, we're very fortunate to have it. Um, and uh, all right, thank you for kind of, as you said last year when I was at the first of the year, kind of breaking down the walls of the clinic to get outside to involve the community more in, in, in very uh, relevant topics. And when Jorge and Monica called me before the holidays, said, you know, would you make a couple of those remarks at, at, at this and it's going to be on teen mental health? I said, you know, sure, I'm happy to do that. And then, um, and we've been very fortunate with three kids, you know, had no issues with that. But on December 24th, we got a call from two of our peers' friends who had children that were our children's age. And um, their daughter, who was 31 years old, committed suicide the day before on December 23rd. And, you know, we talked a little bit and you realized that there's really no greater sense of desperation or despair or helplessness than that situation. This was a family that you know had plenty of resources and, and supportive parents and, and everything. You just realize you don't know when it's going to strike. You don't know who it's going to strike. And um, I think we just have to be thankful for these kinds of conversations. You know, resources like the panelists up here, um, and we just have to do as much as we can do in this area to support uh, teens, support families, uh, to help them really survive uh, these kinds of situations. And when you listen to all of it, you realize how many pressures there are on teens uh, today from how many different directions and things that, you know, those of us who are older didn't have to experience and just sort of listen to some of the technology stuff and the impact uh, you know, that you have today is so different than any of us have. We, didn't have much else to do other than hang around outside and, you know, um, get in trouble, as one of the panelists said. But um, anyway, it's, it's, uh, it's a topic, Jorge, right, thank you for continuing to bring these kinds of topics to us in, in a public forum. I know there'll be another one uh, in the future. And um, uh, thank you to the panelists. It was very insightful. And uh, thank you all of you for coming, and I hope you'll sort of take the word from here and spread it out further in our community. And closing, uh, thank you once again um, for attending, as uh, Councilman uh, mentioned. I want to thank everybody on the panel for uh, giving up their time today to share their expertise. I know uh, Dr. Bartolome is going to drive to LAX now to hop on the plane to go to Texas. So. Um, thank you again to everybody, and I uh, hope everyone has a blessed 2018. We can continue that sense of community and working on different issues. So, thank you.